All right, open your Bibles to Mark chapter 9 today. We're going to be talking about the transfiguration of Jesus, and I'm titling today's lesson, Jesus in the Spotlight, because that's really what's going to happen. Mark 9, verses 2 through 13, tells the story of this transformation of Jesus, and the lesson is clear. It's, it's all about putting the spotlight on Jesus and showing that he's more than a prophet of God, but that he's actually fully God. Now, I don't know what you think about Jesus as you've been studying through the Gospel of Mark with us, but here's what C.S. Lewis famously said about it in his book, Mere Christianity. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God, but let us not come up with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And so just as the disciples are beginning to see who Jesus really is as they walk with him through the Gospel of Mark, many of us are doing the same thing today. So let's turn there. Mark chapter 9, starting in verse 2, it says, Six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain to be alone. And as the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed, and his clothes became dazzling white, far whiter than any earthly bleach could ever make them. And then Elijah and Moses appeared and began talking with Jesus. Jesus is giving his inner circle a glimpse of his divinity here, and it actually mirrors Moses' Mount Sinai experience that we can read about way back in Exodus chapter 33. That's where Moses went up to the mountaintop and he meets with God. And here's what God said to him there. Look, stand near me on this rock as my glorious presence passes by. I'll hide you in the crevice of the rock and cover you with my hand until I've passed by. And then I will remove my hand and let you see me from behind, but my face will not be seen. So this experience here for Peter, James, and John would have reminded them and all of the Jewish leaders of this famous story from Exodus 33. And really what it's showing us, what Jesus is showing us and these three disciples is that he is that God from the Old Testament. But let's go back to that passage in verses two to four. And I want you to pay attention to the last part of that. It says that, that Elijah then appeared along with Moses and they began talking with Jesus. And the question you might ask is why Elijah and Moses? Why would these two guys appear in this vision up on this mountain? And one of the answers can be found in the very last verses of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter four, verses four to six. Here's how the Old Testament closes. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on Mount Sinai for all Israel. Look, I'm sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. See, Moses and Elijah represent the great prophets of the Old Testament. And prophets in the Old Testament... We're all about revealing the heart of God to his people. That's what Moses did with the Ten Commandments. That's what Elijah did as a prophet. That's what all the prophets in the Old Testament were about. They were about revealing God to the people. And that's essentially what Jesus is doing. He's a revelation, the ultimate, the final revelation of God to the people, because he's not just a spokesperson for God. He is fully God. And so the appearance of Moses and Elijah on the mountaintop is really proving the continuity of Jesus's mission with the Old Testament law and prophets like Moses and Elijah. Jesus is the culmination. He's the fulfillment of the revelation of God to the people. So here's what happens next. Verse five, Peter says, Rabbi, it's wonderful for us to be here. Let's make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He said this because he didn't really know what else to say, for they were all terrified. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus with them. So it's funny because Peter panics at the sight of this transfiguration, and so he doesn't know what else to do, so he offers just to get to work. He says, Let's build some memorials for these legendary characters. But notice what the father does. The father is going to draw attention to only Jesus. In fact, isn't it interesting that at the end of this section, Moses and Elijah disappear and the spotlight is only on Jesus. 
it's so easy to get distracted even today with good things, with religion, and to busy ourselves with doing work for God or even studying the law and the prophets. But at the end of the day, a pursuit of God, a biblical pursuit of God, should leave us focused on only Jesus. And this section of scripture closes like this. It says, as they went back down the mountain, Jesus told them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept it to themselves, but they often asked each other what he meant by rising from the dead. They're still trying to make sense of all this. And then they asked him this, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? And Jesus responded, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. Yet why do the scriptures say that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be treated with utter contempt? And I want you to notice that the disciples, even after hearing what the Father said, the Father said, just focus on Jesus. But as they walk down the mountain, the disciples are fixated on Elijah. And they're fixated on the teachings of the religious leaders about Elijah. But notice that Jesus is just trying to bring the focus back to what the scriptures say, not what people say, but what the scriptures say about him. So the father had just told the disciples to listen to Jesus, just listen to Jesus. And it's so hard for them to do that. And the reason is because it's almost like we all have a veil covering our eyes that we can't really fully see Jesus in the spotlight. Paul talked about it like this in 2 Corinthians 3. He says, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His glorious image. All of Scripture puts a spotlight on the person and work of Jesus. And whenever someone turns to Him, the veil is taken away. This is what God wants for each one of us as we continue to read his word, as we continue to interact with him on a personal level like Peter and James and John got to do. He wants to just more and more take that veil away. He wants us to see that Jesus is more than a prophet of God, that he is fully God, that he is the Messiah. He's the one who came and suffered and died and rose from the dead so that we too may be transformed into his image.